thanks very kindly on behalf of the Institute of Human Virology uh, with the JOX Initiative. Uh, I guess we should say welcome to, to everyone. I uh, can also want to acknowledge uh, Jeff Crowley. I haven't seen him in some time, but he was a key part of the President Obama's uh, first term in, in the AIDS office. I don't know the official name of the AIDS office. We can talk about it later. Uh, but also played a leadership role in these more recent years. 17 years ago, we formed, as you already heard from Tony, the Institute of Human Virology. Um, I was the co-founder with Bill Blattner, who heads our epidemiology and public health preventive medicine division. And uh, Bill was also the commissioner for AIDS in Baltimore. That's no longer in operation now, but he helped me align the national uh, plan from the president uh, to Baltimore in its own style and way, I think, in unique aspects in some respects. Bill also has an enormous program in, in Nigeria, and a lot of what he did was the comparison of West Baltimore to West Africa. But that's a story in itself, and I'll be here way too long. Uh, Bob Redfield is not here because he's receiving a clinical reward for, in New York for what he's done in HIV therapy. Uh, the Institute has really uh, developed well we're over 300 people now, I think about 320 people. In a very difficult time, we're doing okay. Uh, so we have basic science and vaccine, and we have clinical division, and we have epidemiology and animal model for divisions. Within the clinical division that Dr. Redfield heads is the place we talk a lot about in this meeting in particular, namely the Jocks uh, Center there. Uh, it started, I guess, as an outreach program from the clinical division to the area to try to make people more aware of the disease. And it became more and more sophisticated in this regard with the great help of this man who died prematurely of AIDS, uh, Dr. Jacques. Or actually, he told me his real name wasn't Jacques. He was, his name was more ending with a vowel like mine. But we won't go into that. I don't know what's true and what's not true because Derek never told me uh, details. But let me say that uh, it, the Institute has a gem uh, led by Derek for many years now. Uh, the Jocks Initiative, and again, I don't think uh, I should do a review of that because I'm not good enough to do a review, but it's been so innovative in, in the outreach kind of program and in the uh, getting information to people uh, that need this information that testing and treating is a key to this epidemic. Uh, Derek suggested that I say a few words about all, all the practical advances have come from basic science. So yeah, I had the basic science division and vaccine development with George Lewis in our institute. It's almost true, but not 100% true. I say it to sort of brainwash Derek and some other people, but it's not 100% true. So let's just summarize the story of where we are. 100 to 200 years ago, HIV came into man. Unfortunately for people in Africa, the primates, the monkeys and chimpanzees in Africa, as opposed to monkeys, primates in South America, or monkeys in Asia, all of whom use primates for food. Unfortunately, the primates in Africa carry the relative of HIV, namely the simian immunodeficiency virus, which in many of those primates doesn't cause any problem for them. They've adapted to it. But if you follow them long enough, some of them will get AIDS. This was, of course, unknown. HIV knowledge came first. We didn't know about the monkey story. So how did the virus get into man some 100 to 200 years ago? In apparently a single isolated case, it could be traced by a brilliant work of my former postdoctoral Beatrice Hahn, who I sponsored for the National Academy of Sciences, not the Institute of Medicine, but the National Academy of Sciences. And she got in more rapidly than I've seen anyone get in. She really defined the type of chimp, the exact location, uh, and then HIV-2, we've already known is from a West African monkey called the Sudimangabe. And she typed it to a single transmission. These are hunters, and the hunters clean animals, and they get cut, and the virus moves from animal to man. They also, when the animal's not dead, get bitten, and we know that that's another route of transmission uh, potential. So how many times did a transmission occur? We don't know. It happened in the rainforest. And did people get sick uh, earlier than that? We don't know. They would have died with their disease in the rainforest. That's not an epidemic. That's not really a big problem. It's an individual problem. So. But apparently, one particular simian immunodeficiency virus from a chimpanzee in likely southeastern Cameroon uh, and into the Congo area, that region of animals, had some simian immunodeficiency viruses 
that quickly moved towards the ability to infect humans. And once in humans, was able to go from human to human by the transmission of fluid, bodily fluid. You can't get it easy. You don't have to be afraid of a person with AIDS. We knew that at the beginning because the first contributions in science to this disease were really not from the basic science. They came from American clinicians on the east and west coast of the United States who identified the disease and told us that it was probably a disease of this critical cell of the immune system we call the T cell, particularly the T helper cell. That's the beginning that makes you think. And secondly, the epidemiologist at CDC made the second important contribution, and that epidemiology was the risk factors were blood, sex, and mother to child. In other words, being born of an infected mother, milk transmission particularly, but other ways as well. Um, and then you, you have that background. Something like that stimulated the notion to Max Essex at Harvard School of Public Health and myself, we were friends that this might be another retrovirus disease. I, there's no time to go into why we have that reasoning, but suffice it to say, the human retroviruses we knew of already were transmitted by blood, sex, and mother to child. They targeted T cells. That was enough. And so that began the idea that led to some productive research. There were many other ideas, some of them completely wild and rather, actually, rather stupid. But that's the way it goes in science. We get all kinds, even from very intelligent people, some ideas were not well thought out. So there was a struggle at the beginning to accept the idea that this might be due to a retrovirus. So how do you, how am I going to prove that? When we began, and the French group began to detect this kind of virus in man, in some association with AIDS patients, we couldn't find it all the time. And you could say, if you're a critic, well, really, when a person has AIDS, because you don't know them, there's no test. All you know is when a person is sick and dying almost. Well, how do you know it's not one of the other microbes that they've got with them? Prove it. How do you prove that? At that time, we didn't have therapy, we didn't have anything. So we knew that finding the virus was going to be difficult for other people because by the time a person had AIDS, they had hardly any T cells left in their blood. And what do you get from samples T cells? We also knew that many labs were afraid to work with it. And thirdly, we knew that many labs that would not have this kind of confidence to culture human blood T cells. We then are looking to a factor we had only discovered in the mid-late 1970s. So we needed something else. We started to get more and more of these virus detections and isolations, we call it, in the laboratory, as did the group in France. But you know, I said this is never going to be enough because it won't be verified. Verification is critical in science for a field to go forward. We needed something else. That's the blood test, the HIV antibody test. It also, when we developed it, preserved our blood supply. It stopped blood trend. People like hemophiliacs who receive blood regularly, or anybody who goes to surgery who gets blood, were threatened. There was a really re significant incidence of blood contamination. Let me give you an example. In Japan, we tested blood there with the antibody test in around, mm, let's say, let me be more precise, I think it was February 1984. And nobody in Tokyo was positive in the hemophiliac in, uh, community. But two to three months later, 20% of their clinic was positive because they don't give blood in Japan, at least not at that time. They take blood from Europeans and from Americans. And they, that's how fast it came. So it was really moving. If we didn't get a blood test, I, I'm often asked this, and I have no answer to it. I don't know what would happen. But all the people who get infected and don't know they're infected, they're infecting other people. It would have been a truly, truly enormous problem. So how did we make the blood test? Well, we knew we needed one. We knew we had to protect the blood supply. And I knew also, I wanted it to convince people this is the cause of AIDS, because I want something fast, simple, sensitive, inexpensive, rapid. That's the blood test that we made. But to do it, how do you get enough material to send to the world, to get verification everywhere, to have the blood test everywhere? We had to be able to produce this virus in large quantities. My technician, Betsy Reed Canole, and independently and working with Betsy, Mika Popovic, who's still at the Institute now, he came with me from NCI. We're able to produce the virus forever in a certain T cell that grows forever in the laboratory. Nobody could do that before. It was a dramatic breakthrough for us. That's the only time in this whole disease I think I smiled or felt the feeling of eureka. You know, you press people always ask, what, you know, do you have parties? Do you celebrate when you have an advance? With HIV, there's never any moment like that, because slowly you're learning, slowly you're learning, and when you have an advance, you're always thinking, oh my God, there's also this by tomorrow, we've got this other pressure, so there's never that moment of pause and reflect and happiness, but this one, when we knew we could grow the virus, we knew it would be all over soon. We knew that we'll be able to prove this 
one way or another and fast because we'll have enough material to make a very sophisticated, wonderful test. So how did, how, one last thing is how did the virus become epidemic and where do we want to go in the future? Well, two, two remaining things. The virus became epidemic in my mind because of the changes post-World War II. The airplane, you know, tourism, um, increase in sexual contacts, more global contacts, maybe increased number of contacts, and um, blood, as I told you already, being shipped from one nation to another. So what was once remote and uncommon became global. But how did it first kindle in Africa? We don't know the full reasons for that, but sociologists and historians say when imperial powers created roads and trucks were moving up and down those roads, but in addition, problems occurred with war and famine and there was an increased movement to cities. So you have a you don't have an epidemic until you have, you don't have a fire until it's kindled. You don't have an epidemic until it's kindled. You have to have a certain concentration of infected people before something can spread. But very quickly, as I said already, remote, I mean, a, a remote infection became a global infection. What was uncommon became relatively common. So today we know what we need to do, right? I mean, we're, we're involved in other viruses, not just HIV, in that we turn to some extent to some basic cancer research, looking for other infectious causes of cancer. Even HIV itself indirectly can increase the incidence of cancer, so we work on that too. But we know what we want to do is eliminate HIV, right? And you'd like to try to bring people who are chronically infected to a still better and better end point. So you'd like, I don't like using the word cure because most of the time I think it, hurts, it leads to some false hope and misinterpretation of data. But we certainly want to make infected people have the virus go away if possible or at least have therapy that is better and better and better. But we wanted to eliminate the epidemic, right? So our institute's involved in the vaccine, which is supported by Gates, which will start phase one trials uh, next year. But if, in the meantime, and if that doesn't work, and if it works imperfectly, of course we need other things. Of course we need education, but it's been proven, as you could think with your own head, that will never be sufficient alone. So there's things like microbicides, but there's nothing better than what you're doing. The answer is to test, 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 and we've known that for a long time but it's now becoming something asserted by government and by cities. Not just here, but in many parts of the world, perhaps almost all over the world. Lots of testing and lots of early treatment. We do that, we lower the virus in an individual. All biology is quantitative. If I'm infected and I have this much virus and I'm in contact with someone, good chance of transmitting. Forget statistics, oh, it's only one of you X hundreds and hundreds of contacts. If I'm viremic and it's high, the efficiency of transmission is quite nice. Don't worry, that virus will get across. So, but if we treat early, test a lot, lower the amount of virus, the chances of transmission are very, very poor. Thus, the epidemic would wane and maybe go out of existence. So that's the hope. That's why what you're doing in outreach in a community that has a high level of infected people cannot be more important on, what's today's date, November, well, on November 4, 2013, nothing is more important. Therefore, this meeting, this program of the jobs, what Jeff Crowley will talk about, these things cannot be more important than the HIV epidemic. I thank you from the Institute for all the things you do to help us and the whole campus in this regard. And I thank the uh, other schools, not just medicine, such as the law school. And, well, I'm not going to go for all the schools in the campus, but it's the first time I've ever seen anything like this happen, and it's a great thing, and Derek, congratulations for this to you and your staff for playing a very central role in all of it. Thank you.